is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. The UBS AGM set to begin any moment now. Now, we go through the timeline, and of course, we also have our man is cranny on the ground in Basel. So it's incredible to think at how quickly uh, Credit Suisse, of course, had gone. It all started with uh, some comments that the Saudi National Bank gave to our Yusuf Gamal Din over in Saudi. That was March 15th. And then four days later, we had this takeover of UBS of Credit Suisse. Then um, Mr. Ahmadi, blast from the past, he was in charge for nine years at UBS. On March 29, 29th, he was appointed back as chief executive. Now he has a big job. Uh, we understand he probably won't be at the UBS AGM today, but he has a big job because with the chairman, uh, Colm Kelleher, they have to recreate, rethink this massive bank. It's the first time that two systemically important banks are put together in Europe. But let's bring in Bloomberg's Manus Kranje, who's in Basel at the AGM, the UBS AGM Manus, uh, starting very momentarily. What's the mood like on the ground? Francine, there's been busloads of shareholders. You can imagine the demographic. It's uh, partic not particularly uh, of the youth. It's certainly those traditional pension fund shareholders that have arrived here. I've just come from inside. It's a huge, voluminous room with a massive staircase all the way down. Today is a day I get a sense where Colin Callagher, the chairman, has got to deliver a message of trust and transition. Transition in that Ralph Hamm is the outgoing CEO who took over from uh, Motti just a number of years ago will be his last moment on the stage in a big public forum and Callagher needs to deliver a message to the politics, the society and to the country of Switzerland which is about trust us, trust us we will be the bank for you. That there was no alternative really in terms of putting this deal together and that is the debate that is at the heart of Swiss society. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what that second speech from Callagher holds a little bit more detail. I think we must create the guardrails in terms of the depth and breadth of what Callagher can actually say about strategy. This is uh, this is about you know bunker time for Ermotti and Callagher from here forward in terms of delivering a strategy today. Today is about a message of trust to Switzerland. Yeah, and I have to say, this is not an easy job. I mean, they have to look at the units. They have to decide what they do with wealth management, with the investment bank. And so this is going to be a hands-on approach. Man, there are two stories that we found out today. So one from FINMA that gave a press conference that finished about 15 minutes ago saying they had weighed or they had thought about putting Credit Suisse in bankruptcy before choosing this UBS deal. How does the leadership at UBS today get the Swiss on board? This is where I believe there will be some kind of horse trading. We're going into a political season here in Switzerland. There's a couple of different stories that have sort of come onto my plate over the past couple of days. It is, you've got one of the big political parties. Will they guarantee the funding for, will they push against the guarantee of the funding for the new UBS Credit Suisse combination? That's one small political sticking point. But more importantly, the Swiss Universal Bank, you asked about it at the news conference, and here's the story that's coming back to me. For Kelleher and Armadi to really get this deal over the line with the politicos and with society, of which more than 50% of this country object to this deal being done because of concentration risk uh, as one major reason, could it be that they are forced to have to consider an IPO for the Swiss Universal Bank? It's a kite flying in the wind by a number of different people who are Manus. saying, look, it's too big a jewel. And it's not likely to happen. Let's see. Yeah. Manis, we're just hearing from the chairman, of course, at UBS. Here he is. We're English. When we sent out the invitation for today's AGM, we expected that we would mainly talk about our strong results in 2022 and our very solid and successful position. In light of the events of the past three weeks, though, some of you may want to ask questions or provide comments on the acquisition of Credit Suisse. And it is important for us to give room for that. In the interest of an orderly and efficient conduct of the AGM, I would like you to ask all questions related to the acquisition of Credit Suisse as part of agenda item one. In accordance with article 13 of the Articles of Association of UBS Group AG, I formally open the AGM, take the chair, and introduce the participants who will support me here on the stage today. Starting 
On the far left for you is Sarah Youngwood, our group CFO, Barbara Levy, our group general counsel, Ralph Hammers, the group CEO, Lucas Gavila, the vice chairman, and Marcus Bauman, our group company secretary. I nominate Marcus Bauman as the secretary. I welcome the board of directors. I also welcome BDO AG Soliturn, which is responsible for the counting of votes, and I welcome the independent proxy Altorfer, Dusch, and Baustein AG Zurich, represented by Dr. Urs Zeltner. Finally, I would like to welcome the representatives of the statutory auditors Ernst & Young Limited, in particular the lead auditors for the 2022 financial year and the notary Matthias Steihelin from the Vischer AG Basel, who will publicly certify certain resolutions of this AGM. On, January, on 3rd of January 2023, we published a notice in the Swiss Official Gazette of Commerce and on our website inviting qualifying shareholders to submit their written requests for the inclusion of individual items on the agenda by the 10th of February 2023. No requests were submitted. The invitation to today's AGM was published in the Swiss Official Gazette of Commerce on the 6th of March 2023, which is also available on our website. A personal invitation was sent to the shareholders entered in our share register. I state that the convening of the annual general meeting was duly conducted in accordance with the Articles of Association and that the annual general meeting therefore has a quorum. As usual, we keep a list of speakers. I ask shareholders who wish to take the floor to register at the speaking desk at the front left of the hall. You will then be called for the agenda item you wish to speak on. <clears throat> I would ask speakers to keep to a maximum spend speaking time of five minutes. Timepieces are installed on the lectern to help you keep an eye on the time. In accordance with Article 17, Paragraph 1 of the Articles of Association of UBS Group AG, at, today, at today's AGM, votes will be decided by an absolute majority of votes cast, excluding blank and invalid votes. An exception to this is the vote on the agenda item 13.2. For this vote, and due to the dependence on each other, also agenda item 13.1, a special majority requirement of at least two thirds of the votes represented and a majority of the par value of the shares represented applies to both resolutions at today's AGM. Finally, I would like to call your attention to the fact that an audio and video recording of the AGM will be made and used as the basis for the minutes and broadcast live on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, valued shareholders, as mentioned, we will address the planned acquisition of Credit Suisse under agenda item one of today's meeting. Let me nevertheless begin with March the 19th, when UBS announced that it would acquire Credit Suisse. It was a historic day and a day we hoped would not happen. Yet it is a significant milestone, not only for UBS and Credit Suisse, but also for Switzerland and for the global financial industry. Credit Suisse will no longer be an independent company. It was an icon of the Swiss economy, a bank that played a vital role in the economic development of Switzerland and a global and respected player. We recognize and honor Credit Suisse's achievements over its 167 year history. At the same time, this means a new beginning and huge opportunities ahead for the combined bank and for the Swiss financial center as a whole. Under the leadership of the incoming CEO, Sergio Ormotti, we will build on the strengths of both firms. Let me now look back on the past year. 2022 was another extraordinary year, one marked by tragedy and uncertainty. The war in Ukraine caused immense suffering and loss, and it continues to do so. It is a stark reminder of how fragile our world is. We also face a multitude of other challenges, including high inflation, market volatility, and a general rise in geopolitical tensions. Despite the difficult environment, 
we reported strong results for 2022. Ralph will cover these in more detail. Let me just say that I am proud of our results with all performance figures in line with the targets laid out. Our performance last year once again demonstrated the effectiveness of our strategy, which I will briefly outline for you. Firstly, we are the leading Swiss bank. Our roots are firmly embedded in Switzerland, which will always be our home market. Together with Credit Suisse's franchise, we will continue delivering value to the Swiss economy. Secondly, we continue to expand our position as the leading wealth manager, particularly through growth in the United States and Asia. They are the largest and fastest growing regions in the world, and they have great demand for our world-class services rooted in Swiss expertise. The Credit Suisse transaction is expected to accelerate our strategic plans in this area. <clears throat> Thirdly, we have a focused investment bank. It is highly competitive in the segments we have chosen to participate in and create synergies with our other businesses. This has not changed with the acquisition of Credit Suisse. In fact, we will significantly reduce the amount of capital allocated to the investment bank to below 25% of risk-weighted assets. I repeat, our growth ambitions are centered on wealth and asset management. This is a business we know well and which benefits from our Swiss heritage and expertise. It's also a business with relatively low risks. It will continue to be our key focus for growth moving forward. Having a clear vision and a sound strategy is important, but precise execution is equally critical for success. This transaction is the first merger of two global systemically important banks. This is not in any way an easy deal to do and brings with it significant execution risk. A main focus of the board of directors of the management will now be on the integration of Credit Suisse. And this is what has led to our decision to name Sergio Ormotti as group CEO for the upcoming journey. However, the integration of Credit Suisse does not mean that other growth initiatives and our efforts in digitalization and sustainability will come to a standstill. Equally, risk management and control, including operational resilience, conduct and prevention of financial crime, remain key focus areas of the Board of Directors. Some words on our share price. Our stock has performed well in 2022. It has the highest price to book ratio compared with our peers in Europe. It is close to the highest in comparison with our US peers. We remain committed to distributing excess capital for shareholders. We repurchased 5.6 billion US dollars of shares in 2022, and we are proposing a 10% increase to the 2022 dividend, which will bring us to 55 cents per share. This adds up to a total shareholder return of 7.3 billion US dollars out of a net profit of 7.6 billion US dollars. That is a payout ratio of 95%. Due to the acquisition of Credit Suisse, we have decided to reallocate part of the repurchased shares for the share exchange and to temporarily suspend our share repurchase program. However, we are committed to resuming it as soon as possible. This is the reason why we have retained the vote on a new share repurchase program on the agenda for today's annual general meeting. Also in today's annual general meeting, we will ask you for your support for a few recurring and special agenda items, such as our non-financial reporting, the sustainability report. As in past years, you will also vote on the compensation report and the compensation for the members of the board of directors and the group executive board. We are convinced that we've achieved a fair and good balance between the interests of our shareholders and our employees. Let me now conclude. Firstly, our strategy is clear and unchanged by the acquisition of Credit Suisse. Secondly, we provide our clients around the globe with the best service, building on traditional Swiss values. 
And thirdly, we are laser focused on integrating Credit Suisse. And be assured, we continue to execute and deliver on the other parts of our proven strategy. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of the Board of Directors. I first want to express my deep respect and gratitude to CEO Ralph Hammers. I will come back to this at the end of today's meeting. Second, I welcome Sergio Ormotti back to UBS and thank him for accepting this challenge. The Board of Directors has appointed him as Group CEO and President of the Group Executive Board, effective as of today. Sergio Amotti was Group CEO from 2011 to 2020. He successfully repositioned our firm following the severe challenges arising from the global financial crisis. He is well placed to lead our combined entity. He has both a unique experience and a deep understanding of the financial services industry in Switzerland and globally. We are convinced that this decision will help deliver a successful integration. I also want to thank our clients for their continued trust and confidence in UBS. I want to thank our employees for their dedication and hard work. Change is never easy and can bring uncertainty, but the focus on our clients is more important than ever. I want to thank the Group Executive Board for its perseverance. And I would also like to personally thank my colleagues in the Board of Directors, especially for their exceptional commitment over the last three weeks. And last but not least, I would like to thank you, our shareholders, for your continued support. I know that we have everything it takes for future success. I'm confident that you will be well rewarded for the trust you put in UBS. Thank you for your attention and for your support in the proposals before you today. Let me now hand over to Ralph. Meine Damen und Herren, ein herzliches Willkommen hier in Basel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Basel, from my part as well. As the chairman has said, March 19 was a shock for all of us, for UBS, for Switzerland. I know that here at UBS we cope well with change. However, we also know that the acquisition of Credit Suisse will be a major challenge. Given the new priorities associated with the takeover of Credit Suisse, the Board of Directors wanted someone with a different leadership profile to head up the firm. As you know, in the interests of the company and its stakeholders, and in the interests of Switzerland and its financial sector, I offered to step down. Integrating Credit Suisse successfully is the most important task for UBS. I am confident that the new CEO, Sergio Ramotti, with his outstanding record and experience, will lead the firm safely through this next phase. I am convinced that this takeover will bring with it great opportunities. It is expected to create a business with more than five billion trillion in U.S. dollars in total investment assets. It will strengthen UBS's position as a leading global wealth manager, operating in the most attractive growth markets and supported by an asset management business with enhanced capabilities and invested assets of over 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars on a combined basis. In addition, there are there are the two Swiss banks. This, this takeover will bring more client assets, more employees, and even more clients, and with all of this, also more responsibility. However, I know that UBS will deal with this, with this responsibility prudently. When I look back on the past year, I see, first and foremost, pandemics. Well, here watching the UBS AGM with me, Paul Davies. He's a banking and finance columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. So, Mr. Hammers, there, the outgoing CEO, saying he's confident, Sergio Armadi. 
Paul, when you look at how UBS today is trying to position themselves, and we had Colm Kelleher, who seems, frankly, the man in charge almost on every front. I mean, this is a huge challenge. Is he speaking to the Swiss because he needs to make sure that he has the politicians, the regulators, but the Swiss people on board? Absolutely. I mean, that was a, a very somber-sounding speech for a man who's just sealed probably one of the most valuable uh, potential deals, um, you know, in, in recent memory in banking. I mean... You know, there's a lot to speak to at home in terms of uh, the amount of jobs that are going to be lost at Credit Suisse, the dominant position that the combined bank is going to have in, in the local market, and the need to ensure that everybody thinks and, and you know, believes that they are doing the best to kind of serve you know, local companies and local people and so on. Um, but at the same time, it's this, it's this hugely valuable deal that they've bought, for, they've bought a bank for very little money. Yeah. But, Paul, so what is most problematic for them? If you look at the Swiss, if you're a Swiss national, so you used to be able to get a mortgage for either bank and play them off each other, if you only have one big bank, first of all, can the regulators you know, encourage that or welcome that, and you lose out as someone who, who, you know, who's a retail investor? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's... Um, Obviously, they waived the competition law in order to, you know, get this deal through very quickly. Um, you know, whether it stays in this shape is really still an open question, I think. There's, there's, there's kind of plenty of risks involved in terms of, you know, secondary sort of antitrust challenges, you know, protests from within the country and, and this sort of thing. You know, they're going to keep the Credit Suisse brand, I think, you know, domestically for a while. And then, yeah, and then we'll see. We haven't heard anything on the investment bank, but if, again, if they pull this through and a lot of it will be execution, I don't know what kind of timeline, Paul, you're looking at, whether it's one, two or three years, yeah. but if they pull this off, they'll have the biggest and probably only investment bank in Europe. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's other investment banks in Europe. There's BNP and there's certainly Deutsche Bank still there to, to challenge them and that sort of thing. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things he said immediately is that we are going to cut risk yeah. dramatically. We want to get, you know, capital, you know, allocated to the investment bank below 25% as quickly as possible. You know, that is, you know, a lot of the risks involved in, in putting these banks together is to do with getting rid of the assets that you don't want, the kind of the prices that you can get for them, you know, how revenues might have been booked by Credit Suisse in its, in its struggle to kind of survive over the last year or so. You know, all of this sort of stuff is going to be very interesting to watch and it's going to be incredibly risky and incredibly hard work for the people in charge. Paul, let's also bring in Armanis Krani who's outside the AGM in Basel for us. Manis, for years you've interviewed Sergio Armadi. Talk to us a little bit about the personalities involved. So you have a very strong chairman, Colm Kelleher. You have, who was seen as a very strong chief executive, Sergio Armati. How will the two work together? Well, I think you have two individuals who come from a very similar background and nature. Both are Motti, ex-Merrill Lynch, ex-Trader, Kelleher, ex-Morgan Stanley, ex-Investment Bank. They come from an environment of where they understand, as I said earlier, of taking risk and what the risks are of not taking aggressive stance and aggressive risk. And Motti, when I sat down with him almost 10 years ago, there was the banner headline, 10,000 jobs to go at UBS. Now, I don't think we ever quite got to that number. But this is a CEO who I know to be very exacting on numbers, very aggressive in terms of delivery, uh, and really does deliver on timelines. I think it's interesting that Callagher, Callagher is Irish-American for want of better words. He is Wall Street. Will he be more aggressive in, in terms of his desire to get the investment bank run down versus the Swiss in Ermotti? Just one or two lines from that speech from Callagher, which I think are quite prescient. One, a temporary suspension to the share buyback, which they hope to return to as soon as possible. That's open-ended. That's the very essence of angst about the dividend and the buyback here. And the second one, Fran and Paul, is the price to book ratio. Kelleher makes it very clear where they're going and what the objective is. It's to be as big and as dominant as the Americans. He talked about the price to book ratio close to our American peers. There's going to be a very serious American drive and tilt for this new combo. Kelleher or Motti. Yeah, and Manish, I find, of course, the chairman of UBS to be very plain talking. Colm Kelleher uh, saying, first of all, that the integration of Credit Suisse will take three to four years, excluding the wind down of the investment bank. So he's talking about targets. He's talking about a timeline. We also understand from the vice chair that they will look at options for the, the Swiss unit of Credit Suisse. So, Manish, what do we know? What's the mood like on the ground? Are people angry? I know we've had a lot of protesters of Credit Suisse. If you're a Swiss national, you look at the AGM, and what's your question to them? 
The AGM will be talking about concentration risk. We caught up, Oliver, as you know, caught up with the Ethos CEO yesterday, and we just caught a quick few minutes with him. Concentration risk. Take Geneva. Take Geneva. Just abstractly take Geneva. Credit Suisse UBS put together will have more than 50% of the mortgage market in that city. If you've got a hot property market that tanks, your concentration risk rises. Compensation. Armati's compensation and the forward compensation won't be dis discussed here today. But you can be sure that will become another issue, the long-term incentive program for bringing back Armati to run the bank. I think the other dynamic is, of course, what are you going to have to give up, Kelleher and Armati, to get this across the line socially and politically? There'll be a lot of wrangling and jangling. The jewel in the crown, as we both know, Francine, is that Swiss Universal Bank within Credit Suisse. Could it be that there has to be a promise, an intention, and we know the road to hell is paved with good intentions, to maybe IPO the Swiss Universal Bank. It will be a subject which will be jangled, but maybe not delivered. And that, Francine, something's got to give to get this bullet train to its destination. But it has left the station, and it is on the way. This merger, this takeover, this gunshot wedding, whatever you want to call it, it's happening. It's happening. You just don't know where the final destination, as you rightly say, is, Manus. What's the trickiest thing in the next couple of months, Paul, to get right? I don't know whether it's tried to make sure that you know some of the bondholders that were also not happy or some of the legal challenges are dealt with, or whether it's really execution and trying to retain staff. I think it's, it's, it's execution and trying to retain staff. Like I said before, it's about you know, the assets in the investment bank at Credit Suisse and, and how you, you know, trim those down quickly. Uh, but it's also about the PR effort within Switzerland. It's about, you know, convincing the people that, you know, this wasn't a deal that was done too hastily, that, it, no. that UBS haven't been given too much too cheaply, uh, that, you know, Credit Suisse couldn't have been saved in some way. I mean, this was a lot of the debate at Credit Suisse's AGM yesterday. There's, you know, there's a huge kind of, you know, political charm offensive that needs to happen at home to, to keep everybody happy with this combination. Yeah, so Manus, I mean, it's very reassuring and a massive shout out, of course, to our team on the ground and here in London, Jan Henrik Forster, Aaron Kirchfeld, uh, Catherine Griffiths and Marin Hoftafmeyer saying that, you know, the UBS chairman had his ducks in a row. They had look at options if something were to happen with Credit Suisse. So I guess because there was that planning from the past, it should also give shareholders, stakeholders, policymakers um, a bit of relief that actually they know what they're doing that is absolutely Kelleher was part of the group that steered Morgan Stanley through the the Lehman period of crisis uh, and averted a complete implosion this is a man who knows how to de-risk and build cash and bolster the bank as well as our money does I think if we take our mind back to that period of time the toxic assets that had to be sold post GFC were immense. They were mortgage backed securities, they were convoluted, complex uh, derivative book trades that had to be unwound. And that's where Armati and Orchell, as we know well, delivered so magnificently. And this is where Kelleher and Armati have the nice. Paul, when you look at, and again, you uh, have written some wonderful, really great pieces looking at tangible book value. I mean, this is a good deal for them. If, if you look at the price and all of the backstop that they got, this could be the deal of a century. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in terms of, uh, you know, what they're getting, especially on the wealth side, it's exactly the kind of deal that I think Colin Kelleher would have wanted to do, you know, if he possibly could. Um, and, yeah, as, as you say, like the initial uplift to the the, uh, the, the tangible book credit per, per share uh, on the announcement of the deal is like 74 percent you know it's a huge increase in value because of the cheapness with which they they got this in terms of you know the exchange ratio for credit suite, credit suite shares and also the write-off of the uh, the 81 the junior bonds uh, as you say I mean there's there's a, just a huge amount of upfront value and that allows them really to kind of I guess tackle a lot of things quite brutally and quite swiftly it gives them a lot of you know, excess capital to, to play with, as it were. I mean, they don't want to burn every cent, obviously, but and they need to kind of work hard to protect the, the Swiss taxpayer and not draw too heavily on some of these federal guarantees. But they have a huge, you know, uh, huge amount of wiggle room, a huge, a huge margin for error in, um, in getting rid of stuff that they don't want. All right, so, Paul, thank you so much. So let's go back to Basel, Switzerland. Our man is is on the ground. Uh, the AGM and the chairman of UBS really laid it out. He gave a short speech. Uh, Paul Hammers, the outgoing CEO, is now talking, and then they'll go back to the chairman to lay out some of the questions on the Credit Suisse integration. Let's just listen in to the final words of Ralph Hammers. 
We have maintained cost and risk discipline. None of this came at a cost to you, our esteemed shareholders. We have generated record results, and the lion's share of these profits have gone to you. We can all be proud that UBS is so strongly positioned. Otherwise, a quick solution for Credit Suisse Rescue would not have been possible. Looking back on my time at UBS, well, it will be a great pleasure, and I will have many happy memories. And that comes thanks to my closest colleagues and the outstanding employees that we have all around the globe. I would like to thank the board of directors, and in particular, I would like to thank Colm Kelleher for the good collaboration. And a big thank you goes to the executive board and my team, who have supported me so much during all the changes here. And above all, my thanks goes to our clients for the trust they have bestowed upon us. And thank you, my dear colleagues, UBS employees. You have worked tremendously hard again this year and have delivered a great performance. And I'd like to most particularly thank you, esteemed valued shareholders, for your support and for your patience in listening one last time to me speaking German. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, for a very gracious speech. Um, I ask Marcus Bauman to provide information on the attendance. Grüezi miteinander. Die Kontrolle der Eintrittskarten hat folgende... Check-in has produced the following figures. We have 1,128 shareholders present plus... All right, that's a little bit more of housekeeping, of actually going through uh, who's in the room, who votes. So, so as they do the housekeeping, let's get back to our stellar panel, Bloomberg Opinions, Paul Davies, Executive Finance Director, uh, Michael Moore, and of course, Armanis Crani is also outside the AGM over in Basel. We heard from the UBS chair, uh, Colm Kelleher, there saying that the Credit Suisse integration will take up to four years. He also says there's a huge amount of risk in the integration. And then the vice chair says they will look at options for the Swiss unit of Credit Suisse. So let's go straight to Michael Moore. Mike, your team has done an amazing job in also breaking news. And we have the story today saying, look, the chairman's top secret prep paid off in this Credit Suisse moment. So they mm -hmm. had been, if not planning, at least, um, you know, drawing up a, a board, I guess, game yeah. theory, if this were to happen. So does it mean that when it happened to us, it came as a surprise in three days, but actually it was well planified? Yeah, I think, you know, Axel Weber, uh, who was the previous chairman, had started these efforts many years ago to kind of contingency planning of what this would look like if they ever did combine with Credit Suisse. And then, you know, early on in the early weeks of this year, uh, Colin Kelleher um, saw, you know, the situation that Credit Suisse was in and said, we need to be prepared. So had some bankers come in from Morgan Stanley, start doing some work of what this would look like. And, you know, the fact that they had to pull this together in a matter of days uh, meant that that, yeah. that prep work was key. Mike, let's go back to the UBS chairman. Credit Suisse shareholders will receive one UBS share for every 22.48 Credit Suisse shares held. UBS has obtained regulatory agreement on the timely approval of the transaction from the Swiss Federal Council, from FINMA, from the Swiss National Bank, and from additional core regulators globally. Stabilizing the situation required urgent action, leaving no time to consult shareholders. The Swiss government therefore exercised its emergency powers to allow the merger to proceed without the customary approval of shareholders. Unfortunately, this means it was not possible to seek your consent beforehand. I understand that not all stakeholders of UBS and Credit Suisse are pleased with this approach. However, all parties, and in particular the Swiss authorities, considered this solution the best of all available options. This acquisition preserves the financial center as a pillar of Swiss prosperity. It provides a stable and sustainable solution. Credit Suisse's clients 
will benefit from the additional value, services, and global reach that a combination with UBS will bring, and the other way around. And whilst we did not initiate these discussions, we believe that this transaction is financially attractive for UBS shareholders. I'm convinced that we made the right choice. By combining forces with Credit Suisse, we are increasing our scale and boosting our capabilities in wealth and asset management, and thereby strengthening our position in our asset gathering businesses. We are reinforcing our position as the leading universal bank in Switzerland, and we are keeping our investment bank right-sized and focused on the areas most relevant to our institutional corporate and wealth management clients. The integration of our businesses is expected to take three to four years, excluding the full wind-down of the Credit Suisse Investment Bank's non-core portfolio. We expect the transaction to generate an annual run rate cost reduction of more than 8 billion US dollars by 2027. Throughout the merger discussions, our focus was on protecting our shareholders' interests, and we believe that we found a good solution. Despite these downside projections, execution risk remains significant. You cannot just put numbers together and reach a sum. You have to understand that there is a huge amount of risk in integrating these businesses. But let me assure you, we are doing everything to execute this deal in the best possible way in order not to let it compromise our financial strength or stability. On the contrary, we expect to remain well capitalized and to remain significantly above our current capital targets after the deal closes. We are confident in our ability to successfully manage the integration of Credit Suisse. Importantly, the transaction, the acquisition does not change our strategy, but rather accelerates its execution. The transaction helps us grow our wealth and asset management businesses, especially in APAC and in the Americas, where we see strong potential. It reinforces our position as the leading universal bank in Switzerland, and it supplements our investment banking capabilities with institutional corporate and wealth management clients in global banking. I will now hand over to our vice chairman, who will provide you with additional background information we will then pool our answers to your questions on the Credit Suisse deal. Thank you, Colin. Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Aktionärinnen und Aktionäre. Thank you, Carl. Good morning, dear shareholders. I would like to... Let's go back to Bloomberg Opinions, Paul Davies, Executive Finance Editor, Michael Moore, and Manus Cranny, who's in Basel for us in front of the AGM. Manus, when you look at, of course, the depth of what they need to do, like, let's not underestimate, and I think the chairman laid this very clearly, let's not underestimate the task at hand. They're present in about 20 countries. Uh, they have to merge these two big banks, figure out exactly what they're keeping and what they're not, whilst at the same time keep on running U UBS as well. What's your take on their biggest challenge right now? culture, the integration of a much, if I can use the word more aggressive, maybe it's perhaps overstating it, just a different culture in terms of know your client, know your providence, what risk will you take, what leverage will you give. There have been a series of leverage issues within Credit Suisse. The benchmark to becoming and integrating into UBS, some would say, is higher than coming from uh, and going to Credit Suisse. So combining all the wealth management of Credit Suisse, it doesn't just jump over the fence into wealth management UBS. There is a higher bar of KYC. There are big practical issues about onboarding everything that's inside the Credit Suisse wealth management business. You've heard Kelleher there. I think there's one interesting line, Francine. We're reinforcing our position as a leading universal bank in Switzerland. So, uh, you know, the idea that maybe the universal bank within Credit Suisse needs to be IPO'd as a political uh, token is it, it, still up for debate. There's a great deal of resistance to this deal. The Sontag Blick Sunday newspaper, four out of five people here in this country want the Swiss Universal Bank spun out. But I think the biggest issue is going to be about integration. And he made it very clear again about bringing the size and the scale of that investment bank down. The investment bank is to serve. Their role is to serve wealth management as it is enacted within UBS. So the hurdles to getting everything inside the bank and keeping everybody on board, it's going to be hard. It's about culture, Francine, and that, that's one of those intangibles. I've lived through a number of mergers, and culture 
is at the heart of being part of the new institution. Yeah, and culture, you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to, to define or it's very difficult to change because it takes years. Paul, this is also something that you were um, actually mentioning in a podcast that we did with Manus, is that the culture at Credit Suisse, I mean, they're always side by side in every Swiss bank, but the culture at Credit Suisse is much more risk-taking, it's much more go-getter, also because they didn't get that government bailout. 12 years ago. So how can the culture, how does they, how do you change actually the culture to, to try and make this super bank? Uh, well, I think they are going to go through the people that they want to keep sort of almost one by one and kind of talk to them about, you know, how they need to behave, how they need to kind of, you know, ad address uh, what they do, you know, the risks that they take and, and what their freedoms are to operate within UBS and how that might be different to, to what they had with Credit Suisse. I mean, I guess it's going to be, um, we had a story last week, I think, about you know how they were going to apply a culture filter to the people that they were taking on board. And so I guess you know there might be people that they think they want from the start, but once they kind of talk to them and, and think about you know, yeah. their own attitude to working for the bank, they might decide actually that you're not the person for us after all. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a long and, and, and tricky process, I'm sure. So, uh, Mike, I mean, this is again about executions, about culture. I mean, this seems like the impossible task. Again, they got a great deal, but when do, when do we measure success? Is it, is it six months from now, 12 months, or does it really take four years? I think we'll get a sense in a, in a couple of years of how it's going. Um, you know, the two main things that Keller has to do is merge these two wealth businesses and wind down the riskier parts of the investment bank. The good news for him is he did, Morgan Stanley did both of those things a decade ago. They merged Smith Barney with their wealth business. That took several years, it hit some bumps, but they got it done and the stock has reflected that. And then Kelleher was in charge of winding down some of these risky assets at Morgan Stanley. So he's done this before, he knows the playbook, uh, but as we've said, it's. Um, you know, going to be a question of culture. Yeah. And I think there are some elements of Credit Suisse that they would like to take on. I mean, Iqbal Khan was at Credit Suisse in the wealth business. Now he runs it at UBS. They've been trying to do more lending to clients, doing more transactions with clients, the way Credit Suisse has traditionally done, whereas UBS has gathered a lot of assets but hasn't done as much lending. So there are some elements they might want to bring over, but they don't want to run into the issues that Credit Suisse has faced. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your insights. Bloomberg Opinions, Paul Davies, executive editor fi from finance, Michael Moore, and Manus Cranny, of course, our very own uh, TV star, looking at the banks in Basel. You want, if you want to keep on watching UBS as AGM, and I know many of you will, you can also go on to Live Go, L I V E Go, on your Bloomberg terminal. Coming up, Finland joins the club. The Nordic nation has its NATO membership approved. We find out what that means for the relationship between Russia and the alliance next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on France and Aqua here in London. Now, Finland has officially become the 31st member of NATO as the alliance's foreign ministers continue their two day meeting in Brussels. Today, the focus shifts as the head of Commission Ursula von der Leyen and French President Emmanuel Macron head to Beijing to meet President Xi. We also think that Emmanuel Macron is just talking live in Beijing. Now, for more on all of this, let's go straight to our European correspondent, Maria Tadeus. So, Maria, just how significant is this NATO expansion? Uh, yes, Francine, and, and what a 24 hours uh, we are seeing, and what a 24 hours we are going to see, because as you say, we have the NATO meeting, but also the in conjunction, uh, the head of the commission and the French president just now in China with live pictures uh, that we are showing. Now, when it comes to Finland, uh, just a historic moment yesterday. It was one of those moments that you witnessed, and you go, this is one for the history books. There was a lot of emotion yesterday, too, with the Finnish delegation when the flag uh, went up, the way that this was described by the 
the Finnish president and the NATO secretary general is that this is a win-win for both, and it will help to strengthen and embolden security both in the Nordics but also the Baltic Sea. Now, there's pending, of course, as you know, uh, Sweden. Remember, this was a joint bid. The two countries wanted to enter uh, at the same time. They applied at the same time, but obviously that's no longer the case. Now, Sweden has run into a number uh, of issues, particularly with Turkey. But again, the message uh, yesterday from the NATO head and the Finnish president is that Nordic security will not be complete until Sweden joins, and they have to do so before the summer. What's NATO's, and we're just looking at live pictures of the French President Emmanuel Macron and Maria speaking in Beijing. So what's NATO's view of Beijing? Yes, and in Francine, as you know, this is a very complicated relationship precisely because it is so multifaceted in, in so many ways. When you look at NATO, what they have expressed, and they have done this very vocally, is that they worry about the ties between Russia and China, in particular in the context of the war in Ukraine. We also know that lethal aid that is seen as an absolute red line. But then, of course, there's the issue about potential mediation. And the French president right now, he just said, you have to talk to China if you want to get a solution potential solution to the war in Ukraine. Uh, ultimately, it's Xi Jinping that has some clout over Vladimir Putin. But this is not consensus. It is controversial. And, Francine, there's a number of European officials who, frankly, they say, if you believe China is going to mediate in this, you're naive. They've had a year to do it, and they haven't done so. Also, yesterday, the Lithuanian foreign minister, very tough on this, repeating, China only wants to help China. All right, Maria, thanks so much. Maria Tadeau there on the ground for us in Brussels, and we'll continue watching that speech of President Macron. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Garrens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Johnson & Johnson has agreed to pay close to $9 billion to resolve all cancer lawsuits tied to its talc-based powders. The world's largest maker of healthcare products is hoping to settle about 60,000 claims and fund a trust set up in a U.S. bankruptcy court to cover future liabilities. The company has with ready withdrawn its talc-based products from the market. Now, Italy is said to be studying ways to curtail the influence of China's Sinochem on tire maker Pirelli. Bloomberg has learned that some of the options include limiting information sharing on strategic technology with board members appointed by the Chinese company. The discussions are another sign of rising tensions between China and the West over key technologies. And General Motors is cutting 5,000 jobs around the world. CFO Paul Jacobson says it's part of a move to reduce costs that will save a billion dollars annually starting this year. The voluntary buyouts cover 6% of GM's 81,000 white-collar employees. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Coming up, we'll continue to bring you the very latest from the UBS AGM. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, and banking today. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the AGM uh, of UBS is currently underway in Basel. We heard from the chairman, uh, Colin Kelleher, that the integration of Credit Suisse will take three to four years, excluding the wind down of the investment bank. Well, let's bring in one man who knows both banks very well, Manus Krani, who's in Basel in front of the AGM for us. Manus, he was very plain talking when you hear from the chairman, Colin Kelleher. He says, look, this is not easy easy it's going to be a huge amount of risk uh, in the integration what did we learn a message for switzerland we're here this is for you this is what we're doing our roots are in switzerland they recognize credit suisse it was a new beginning and a new opportunity i think you've hit the nail on the head this is a, a, a chairman who is identifying the risk of integration he has been through many a crisis along with Ermotti. I think he's making it very clear, Francine, that this is two huge systemically important banks. Uh, and he's going, getting ready to go head to head with the Americans. That was my undertone takeaway when he talked about the price to book ratio of this bank, the new bank, going head to head with the U.S. 
Manus, and you know, you really hit the nail on the head. First of all, it's about culture. These are two very different banks. Uh, one took a lot more risk. Uh, very, you know, so in some cases, even more of a cowboy attitude is, is what's been described uh, behind the scenes. And then you have UBS, of course, that had been bailed out over a decade ago. So how do you integrate the two? Well, if you look back in history, that UBS, SBC, that, that bailout, that, that time that Armadi came in, uh, he was parachuted in as the new CEO, they created a very aggressive risk management style. It's about fees, it's about building, whereas there was always this swagger to the Credit Suisse guys and girls over there who went out on the road. They took more risk, they offered different product, and to that extent, be very clear, not everything within the family of Credit Suisse is going to jump the fence and make it over the fence into UBS because of KYC, because of the various benchmarks that UBS sent relative to Credit Suisse. So it's not a dumb deal that they paid $3.5 billion for $45 billion worth of assets and that they all come over the fence. I think there's many hurdles, political, political hurdles, social mm -hmm. hurdles here, Francine as well. Manus, thank you so much, Manus Cranny. Of course, on the ground in Basel, he'll be live with us throughout the day. And you can continue watching that UBS AGM on your Bloomberg terminal. Just type LIV Go on the Bloomberg terminal. Coming up, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester speaks to our Michael McKee in New York. That's 6.30 a.m. London, actually 6.30 p.m. London time. So don't miss that. This is Bloomberg. We today uphold our solemn responsibility to ensure that everyone stands equal before the law. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who seek to destroy it. Under New York state law, it is a felony to falsify business records with intent to defraud and an intent to conceal another crime. That is exactly what this case is about. This fake case was brought only to interfere with the upcoming 2024 election, and it should be dropped immediately. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Donald Trump denounces his indictment in New York as politically motivated. The former president spoke hours after pleading not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. UBS holds its annual meeting in the wake of a historic takeover. Swiss regulators now say they considered putting Credit Suisse into bankruptcy. And Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says rates should rise above 5% and stay there for some time to push down inflation. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Anna Edwards. Matt Miller is in New York. And Matt, we got a whole lot to get through this morning. We're still assessing the fallout of that historic court appearance in AGM. And for the sake of these markets, finally some breathing room on the jobs front. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are uh, looking ahead, though, still to Friday's number with some trepidation, right? The markets mm. closed lower yesterday, uh, at least here in the U.S., in the cash trade, and we see futures down again today after it should be noted the S&P 500 climbed to over 4,100. So right now, futures are down a little bit less than a quarter of 1% as rates rise, but again from a very low level. We again have that situation where yesterday at this time, rates were considerably higher than they fell throughout the session and are now coming up from that low level. So 335 now, um, we have seen a continued sinking of rates, at least at the 10-year uh, level, and a shrinking of the inversion um, of the twos, tens. So take a look at NYMEX crude. It hasn't really moved since the jump that we got on Monday following the surprise OPEC plus cut 
on Sunday. It's held relatively stable between 80 and $81 a barrel for WTI. Brent around 85 or $86. You haven't seen a lot of movement there, and we haven't seen a lot of movement around Bitcoin either. It's been hovering around the $28,000 level. It rose up to about $28,800. It has been uh, down below $28,800 eight in the high 27s, but right now it's holding at 28,545. Uh, that's digital gold, and the real movement, I think, in terms of uh, global markets is in the actual metal stuff, and Danny, I know you're going to hit on that in one second. I want to get to some big moves in Asia, um, not the uh, broader index, the Asia Pacific index down about a half a percent, but it's really the Kiwi, the New Zealand dollar um, that's interesting right now. It's gained uh, some strength against the U.S. dollar after a surprise rate hike by the RBNZ, uh, up 50 basis points. And that's a space to watch, especially after we saw the RBA pause yesterday because they're in that same sort of commodities pocket, but with very different uh, policies. The Nikkei closed down more than one uh, and two-thirds percent. So pretty big drop for Japanese stocks as the U.S. dollar loses some ground against the yen. Danny, what are you seeing in Europe? Most regional benchmarks are moving lower, Matt, not with a lot of conviction. It goes to what you said. We have jobs on Friday. But remember, equity markets and actually all of European markets except for FX will be closed. We know what can happen in the space of a normal weekend. What could happen in the space of a long weekend? Perhaps that's not an environment that you'd want to be taking risk into Thursday and into the close on Friday. Before Friday, I should say. The only market that's doing better are FTSE 100 stocks up to tenths of 1%. A lot of precious metals. Miners are there, and Matt, as you mentioned, gold is doing better after yesterday, so perhaps that's an impetus behind that. Auto is one of the sectors underperforming, so the DAX is underperforming, as you'd suspect. So overall, the Europe Stock 600 is down two tenths of one percent. Sterling takes a dip from its highest level since June. The UK Treasury is set to appoint or at least announce who they will appoint as a new member to the BOE in this week. Tenreiro steps down in the summertime, so that will be her replacement. We did also have the leading institute saying that they don't believe Germany will be entering a recession this winter. Does that mean the ECB can continue with their path of hiking rates? That's what bond traders are voting with their wallets this morning. Selling German bonds, a two-year is up another seven basis points. And Matt, here's what you mentioned, gold. Not a lot of action this morning. The bulk of this move was yesterday after jolts fell to the lowest level since 2021. That meant a weaker dollar, and it meant gold could finally take off, reaching its highest level in 13 months. We're now around 30 bucks away from an all-time high. And Matt, I know I stole this from my Europe board. Here's my justification. Just down the street at Threadneedle Street below the BOE, they store tons of gold. In my mind, that makes it a European asset. It's the equivalent, I promise I looked this up just before the show, four statues of liberty is the weight of the amount of gold underneath the streets, basically where I'm standing right now. Wow. Uh, I know we have mm -hmm. a lot here as well under the federal uh, or next door to uh, the NYSE, um, but... That's a lot for Statues of Liberty. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah, yeah, your fun fact of the morning. Very impressive <laughs> stat. People can use that in the city of London. Let's get back to the uh, political, legal story that um, really hogged the spotlight yesterday. Donald Trump has denounced his indictment in New York as a politically motivated one, and he tried to link the case to grievances he has long deployed to hold sway over his supporter supporters. The former president spoke at his estate in Florida hours after he pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta has been covering the developments for us all week. She's been, for the most part, uh, down there outside the Manhattan DA's office. Kriti, what's the read through um, now after we got all of the uh, details from the indictment and, and, and what does this mean for the election cycle coming up? Well, the timing is everything here because now that we have the arraignment, the first hearing date is scheduled for December 4th uh, and it could be a case that goes a year even longer and of course is going to run right into that 2024 presidential uh, election. What's really important to keep in mind here is the way that it's being interpreted. Remember as he came for the arraignment the traditional mugshot was not taken uh, traditional social media was not used and actually even discouraged by prosecutors. They even went as far to ask the judge to say, can
can President Trump limit his social media use as this uh, trial is going on? The judge saying no, but we have to be very careful about uh, what he does actually put. And remember, he's already removed a live broadcast from the courtroom. Even still, photographs are potentially uh, going to get removed down the road as well. So really, the concern here is could, to what extent could this be used to rally the base and even uh, kind of help create a little bit of a campaign event, something that you really saw uh, at 8.15 last night in Mar-a-Lago when he discussed this and used it as a way to rally his base. Probably not great news for his Republican challengers for the presidential campaign. H how are Republicans at the moment viewing this legal debate, Critty? You know, you would think it would be a little bit more of a hurdle. I think it's important for a global audience to remember, even if he is convicted with this criminal charge, this does not in any way disqualify him from running for office or even being a contender for the 2024 presidential election. I think the, it's best said, or the sentiment is best uh, said by Mitt Romney, uh, a former presidential candidate himself, and really seen uh, broadly as a voice of reason of the GOP. He writes, I believe former President Trump's character and conduct make him unfit for office. Even so, I believe the New York prosecutor has stretched to reach felony criminal charges in order to fit a political agenda. And this is something you're hearing across uh, the Republican base, the idea that even regardless of what side you stand on in support or against President Trump, at the end of the day, perhaps a prosecutor, Alvin Bragg, is stretching the charges. And just for our international audience who is not familiar with the legal system, ordinarily falsifying business records is a misdemeanor. The fact that it's being used to obstruct a crime, allegedly, that's the part that takes it to a felony. And that's really the argument that uh, the Trump's defense team is going to say is far-fetched and goes too far. All right, Kriti, thanks very much. Kriti Gupta covering this for us all week long. Let's get back to the markets and the banking story that won't seem to go away. UBS's annual general meeting is underway with a focus on the path ahead for the Swiss lender. UBS chairman Colm Kelleher spoke on the takeover of Credit Suisse. This transaction is the first merger of two global systemically important banks. This is not in any way an easy deal to do and brings with it significant execution risk. Let's get to Bloomberg's Manus Cranny. He is in Basel, Switzerland, where he belongs. Manus, uh, great to see you back on the case here. I think of the Swiss banks as really uh, your domain. Uh, what do you make of this and what was Kelleher's message? Kelleher's message, good to see you, by the way. Uh, yeah, my spiritual home, Swiss banking. <laughs> Kelleher's message, Irish American, Ron Morgan Stanley, saw you guys through thick and thin, he's here. This man had a message, it was to Switzerland. There's a huge amount of political angst here, social angst here, take the polls. They don't want this deal. The public here just don't want this massive concentration risk. Kelleher's message was simple. This is for Switzerland. It's a new beginning, a new opportunity, and we are firmly embedded in Switzerland. But he also had a key message for the global shareholder, the roster. It's going to take four years to do this deal, and there's a huge amount of execution risk. This is the critical issue, uh, Matt uh, and, and Danny. There is a lot to play for uh, in terms of putting this together. The culture, the climate, the risk-taking. It's a train that has left the station, the shape of the destination, TBC. Manus, what's been the message from shareholders in this? Well, inside there, Oliver's on, on the link inside. I don't have the shareholder uh, narrative coming through my ear, but Oliver's sort of recounting to me. Uh, the, the, the one group that looks after pension funds here, they're concerned about concentration risk. Geneva, abstract. Take your mind, Lake Geneva, you're there for the summer, you're on the boat. Once these two banks come together, they're going to own 50% of the villas on either side of the lake. Wow. They're going to own 50% of the mortgage market in Geneva. And that, that's concentration. You know, people use big words, concentration risk, uh, you know, risk weighted, weighted, weighted assets. That's what you're risking, is that one bank owns 50% of an entire city. So it's about that. It's about climate. It's about compensation. Uh, and it is about... It is about the risk of the major competitiveness here dissipating. And that, that's a very real risk. And that's where the rub of it comes. What have Kelleher and Armadi got to give up to get this deal over the line? The vice chair makes the point that there is a discussion around the Swiss Universal Bank of Credit Suisse. Just putting it on the table, pushing it back to you.
All right, Manus, great to have you back. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny there in Basel. I think it's fair to say he knows more about the Swiss banking system than uh, any reporter out there and uh, knows the people involved better as well. So uh, Manus covering it from the outside. Oliver Crook there, our uh, reporter, normally in Berlin, displaced to Switzerland uh, to cover this as well. Later this hour, we're going to dig into today's big take on how UBS pulled off one of the biggest bank deals ever in a matter of days. That's a story that you don't want to miss on the terminal. Highly recommend you read that. NI Big Take. Go and uh, stick with us for more coverage of this forced acquisition. Now to get back to the Federal Reserve, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester came out yesterday and said interest rates should rise above 5% this year and stay there for some time. She also said the peak rate depends on how fast inflation eases. I plan to remain diligent in setting monetary policy to return the economy to price stability in a timely way and to be judicious in balancing the risks so as to minimize the pain of that journey. Joining us now to unpack Mester's comments is Christine Aquino, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Markets. Christine, uh, what do you make of Mester statement, all the Fed speak, we've had a ton of it uh, recently, especially in light of the falling inflation numbers that we're seeing. Well, Matt, I think this really just drives home the point that there is quite a division building now between Fed policymakers and the message that they're trying to deliver, which still remains quite hawkish, and what we're seeing in the markets, which are pricing rate cuts for the Fed before the end of this year. And so there is quite a big gulf between what policymakers are telling us and what markets are telling us. And so that really just brings us back to what we're seeing in the data. I think that will be the decider of who wins this round of markets markets versus central banks. And if I have to say, if I were looking at the data prior to this week, I would have said that those rate cuts being priced by the end of the year look a little bit overdone. But then since then, we've had weaker manufacturing data, weaker signs in the job market. So perhaps there's a little bit of credence to some market participants thinking maybe a rate cut would be warranted by the end of this year. It's not the base case for a lot of people, but certainly that rate risk is building in the markets as we see. Probably not helping us make sense of any of it is the fact that we have divergence among sort of similar central banks. RBA yesterday decides to pause while the RBNZ, which has similar inflation numbers, surprises a 50 basis point hike. What do you make of that divergence? Yeah, very interesting, Danny, because both Australia and New Zealand are, of course, small open economies, very much exposed to the global undercurrents. And so the fact that they decided to go their separate ways in terms of monetary policy speaks a lot about how really this is filtering through to individual economies, right? I mean, RBNZ's actions remind me of the so-called pea shooter. You know, back in the days when they were intervening in the currency, they tend to do this sort of thing when the markets are kind of moving toward the direction that they desire anyway. And so, you know, what we've seen over the last few weeks perhaps is a pause in that dollar a strength story, right? We've seen the dollar pulling back. So it seemed like an opportune time for the RBNZ to strike with its peace shooter again and uh, take the opportunity to lift the currency via that bigger than expected rate hike. All right, Christine, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Christine Aquino there runs our MLive team and covers, obviously, all the central bank action that drives markets for us. Highly recommend you check out the blog MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Let's get a look now at some of the stocks we're watching in pre-market trading today. Johnson & Johnson is a big one. It's up 3% after agreeing to pay $8.9 billion to resolve all the cancer lawsuits tied to the talcum powder uh, and talc-based powders um, that it makes or made has now taken off the market. Um, it's going to give Johnson & Johnson this settlement a fresh attempt to contain the liability um, uh, at, concerned or connected to that. InfloRx, Inflarx, Inflarx, received FDA emergency use authorization for its treatment of critically ill COVID-19 patients. The ticker IFRX, you can see it's up 12% in the pre-market this morning. Um, it's a little known name. Another name that you may not know, D-Local. It's a Uruguayan payment solutions company. It's based in Montevideo, but it's listed here on the NASDAQ, and it's a $5 billion company. It reported earnings per share for the fourth quarter that missed the average analyst estimate, and as a result, it's tanking down 14% in the pre-market. Danny?
Ooh, some nice ones there, Matt. Uh, definitely we'll keep an eye on those as the uh, Open in New York comes within a few hours. But before that, coming up, Matt and I are going to be speaking to Sonia Martin, Chief FX Strategist at DZ Bank, as we assess these divergences between the G10 central banks. And speaking of which, later today, Bloomberg's Michael McKee is going to be sitting down with Cleveland Fed President Loretta Master. That interview is going to be at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. here in London. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Danny Berger out in London. Anna Edwards is off this week. I saw a great chart on the Bloomberg terminal this morning that shows cocoa bonds have come back to levels that we saw before the Credit Suisse failure and forced sale to UBS. Remember, these are the bonds that were driven down to zero in the wake of that takeover. Outside of Switzerland, you didn't have such serious covenants. Um, nonetheless, it uh, looks like people threw the baby out with the bathwater and maybe um, that uh, panic has been resolved now um, as we put some time between us and that fateful weekend. Joining us to talk more about this is Phil Serafino. He is a Bloomberg's senior markets editor. And Phil, this just shows to me that we're putting this in some sense in the rearview mirror. What do you think? Absolutely. I, I would agree. Um, you know, a couple of weeks back when the uh, Credit Suisse um, was sold over the weekend, the market, there was a little bit of panic, especially around uh, bank stocks and uh, uh, bonds issued by banks. That has kind of receded a little bit. The market kind of is, has accepted that uh, uh, no other major institution is on the edge. And now it's sort of back to business as usual, which means, you know, as uh, your previous guest, Christine, was mentioning, the market is hoping that the Fed will cut rates later this year or certainly at least stop raising rates um, and that's kind of what's been driving the equity market. Um, the market hasn't really gone anywhere uh, for the past couple of weeks because people are just waiting to see what, you know, uh, how far is the Fed going to go? Phil, does business as usual mean tech continues to outperform? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really amazing. Uh, in the U.S. and Europe, tech is leading the way. And that's sort of a bet on um, the market cooling, uh, the economy cooling down significantly, so there won't be much economic growth. And in an environment like that, you want companies that have secular growth trends. Um, the risk is these are still highly valued stocks. Um, if the Fed doesn't get it right, if we in, in fact end up having a recession, even the secular growers like big tech are going to suffer. So uh, there's a lot riding on that. Um, you know, there's some sentiment that that maybe tech is getting into a little bit of a bubble when you're up 20 percent year to date on, on some of these tech indexes. Mm. So uh, yeah, I think the market is pretty had, nervous about that. Yeah, and it just had a giant short bet on it heading into this year. So a, a lot of nervousness may be uh, wiped out and maybe it'll come back on. Phil, thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's Sil Phil Serafino. And for more market analysis and live go, is where you want to head on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. As gold rises over $2,000 and gets back closer to an all-time high, we'll talk to an FX strategist. Sonia Martin joins us, chief FX strategist at DZ Bank out of Frankfurt. We'll talk to her about the yen over 130 as we approach UADA's first BOJ meeting as well. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Donald Trump denounces his indictment in New York is politically motivated. The former president spoke hours after pleading not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. UBS holds its annual meeting in the wake of a historic takeover. Swiss regulators now say they considered putting Credit Suisse into bankruptcy. And Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says rates should rise above 5% and stay there for some time to push down inflation. 
I'm Danny Berger in New York. Matt Miller in London, I should say. Matt Miller is the one in New York. Anna Edwards is off, so probably still in London somewhere. I'm in New Matt, York. While <laughs> you're in London. Matt, what year is it? What planet am I on? Just to what be city clear. am I in? Thank you. You know, there's a lot of confusion. That. There's <laughs> a lot of confusion, Danny. Uh, I, I, it's understandable. Let's take a look at what's going on in the markets. Thanks, uh, Matt. First That's off, kind of you. <laughs> U.S. market, uh, U.S. futures, I should say, down right now about a quarter percent. We finished lower in the cash trade yesterday, but it, notably, um, we're up over 4,100 on futures, and we were up uh, over 4,100 on uh, the cash trade as well on the benchmark index. So a relatively high level. I think it's fair to say um, for stocks, the S&P is up, what, 7% year to date. The NASDAQ is up uh, 20%. Um, the NASDAQ 100 in a, bear, in a bull market, I should say, um, since it's December lows. So we've come a long way, baby, is my point. Um, Ten-year yields continue to fall further. Okay, today, uh, this moment, they're up three basis points, but that's because they fell so far yesterday. And we've seen this pattern over the last few days. Um, we come in here, I quoted at like 363, and then the next day I'm looking at 351, but telling you that it's rising in terms of yield. It's the same story today. Yesterday it was 354, I think, this time. Then it came down throughout the session, and now it's rising up from that lower level. So 337 is what you're looking at there as investors really continue to buy um, government debt. NYMEX crude is an interesting you know, story. Obviously, after the Sunday surprise that we got from OPEC Plus, it jumped five bucks a barrel, but it's really held there all week long. We're only at Wednesday, but it is a shortened week. Um, you know, the NYSE closes on Good Friday, so tomorrow's the last trading day. Uh, NYMEX crude at 80.53 right now. And then Bitcoin. I was thinking a lot about this as I drove in this morning because there was a time in my life when I really considered it a currency. And in fact, on the Bloomberg terminal, the asset class key that we use is currency, XBT currency. But I wish I hadn't spent a couple of Bitcoin on groceries in a beer in 2011 because now it would be worth so much more, right? Think about how many pints I could buy with 28,516. I'm going to go ahead and call it a store of value now, or at least a commodity of some sort. And uh, you can send me the hate mails later. Take a look at uh, what we're uh, playing with in the pre-market this morning. J&J &J is really the big company to pay attention to. It came to a settlement, agreed to pay $8.9 billion to resolve all the cancer lawsuits tied to its talcum powder-based products. Now, that's a lot of money, and you'd think, ouch, that hurts, but at least they're able to put it in the rearview mirror, and as a result, um, the stock is up more than 3% in the pre-market. You have InfloRx, which you know, I highly recommend they change their name, but they did receive an FDA emergency youth author, use authorization for their uh, treatment for critically ill COVID-19 patients. So InfloRx is up 12%, uh, big jump in the pre-market. D-Local is a Uruguayan payment services provider. You probably never heard of them, but they do have a $5 billion market cap. They missed estimates um, for earnings, and that market cap is gonna shrink considerably at the open if this NASDAQ listed uh, company trades down as far as they are in the pre-market. And finally, Beyond Meat, reiterated as an underperform, essentially a sell at Piper Sandler as interest in plant-based meat declines further. Danny? Matt, this is going to be my attempt at making you feel better. Imagine how many more pints at the local pub I could afford if I had insisted on being paid in dollars instead of sterling. Yet, <laughs> I should say... The pound is the best performing G10 currency this year. So, hey, maybe things are moving in my favor. But this morning, it certainly is not. Sterling is down uh, about three-tenths of 1% versus the dollar. It did hit near a June high yesterday. We're coming off of that a little bit. We're also waiting for the U.K. Treasury to announce who will be the next in line to take over 10 Rayro spot at the BOA, BOE. European stocks down about a third of 1%. But it's a strange day. Liquidity is low. Volumes are low. We're about to head into a long weekend. We've seen very volatile weekends. Not a time you really want to be taking any sort of risk or leaving that on your portfolio. It's perhaps a time for portfolio hedging into the weekend. Germany two-year yields, those are up about seven basis points following what's happening in the U.S. But we have seen Germany move more recently. That rate differential is growing because of the East ECB's steadfast commitment to continue to hike and expectations that, hey, 
maybe this economy will be okay. The leading institutes say that they don't expect a recession from Germany this year, which we know when we started the energy crisis, that certainly was in the cards. People thought it was in the cards much sooner. Meanwhile, gold, Matt, I, I know you've got your eye on this one. We're finally back above $2,000. We are at the highest level in 13 months. We're just 30 bucks away from an all-time high. Part of this is the bid to havens over the past month uh, that we've seen since the banking crisis, erupt crisis erupted. But what really got it going yesterday were those jobs figures. Uh, jolts falling to their lowest since 2021 job openings. That meant a weaker dollar, and it meant finally, Matt, gold could shine. Yeah, I think uh, gold fascinates me, especially now, because I always worry what we're going to do when the cordyceps takes us all over. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you watched The Last of Us, but when the fungus turns us into zombies. But will they accept gold? I don't think they'll Yeah, they'll well, that's, care. I, think I don't the, think that'll save us. That's the prepper idea, you know? That's the Ron Swanson base yeah. case that gold is the only thing it. you have to spend. The other thing is, I always connect gold to currencies as well because, again, the asset class key, XAU currency. Now, it's not really, obviously, you can't go to the grocery store and buy anything with gold, and most grocery stores don't take Bitcoin either. But I still want to put a question on this to an FX strategist. Sonia Martin joins us right now, chief FX strategist at DZ Bank. And Sonia, I'm sure you don't focus on these things, but it's interesting to see what people treat as, in a sense, safe haven assets. You know, um, gold is at $2,000. Bitcoin has risen considerably um, this year. The, the yen is still over uh, 130. What do you make of, or as I should say back to 130 from 145, what do you make of this um, really short dollar trade? You know, the Bloomberg dollar index has fallen down to 1225. Mm. Yeah, the dollar has come under considerable pressure of late, and I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, so on one hand, I think you mentioned it earlier, there's obviously the fact that the market is now pricing in not only the end of the Fed rate hike cycle, but is also looking for the Fed to actually cut rates. And the rate cut expectations that the market is currently pricing, and they're actually quite aggressive, and that weighs on the dollar. And I think the other factor here is the fact that we have, have seen this massive turbulence in the banking sector and massive volatility in the market, also in the equity market. And, you know, consumption in the U.S. is driven very much by, you know, the performance of the equity market and by credit availability. And I think there's a concern that following the events around SVB, et cetera, that both of these factors could weigh on consumption. And then last but not least, the question, of course, of whether the last bastion of the U.S. economy, the labor market is finally starting to show some signs of weakening and all of that accumulates to weaker dollar performance at this moment. You know, I, I mentioned the yen at, uh, at mm -hmm. 130, 131, right? And at one point, I can't remember the, the record uh, that we saw, the recent record, but I guess it was uh, up around 140, 145. Yeah. Um, what does this mean in terms of Ueda? He's coming into his first meeting. We expect him to abandon yield curve control, right? I think a lot of people thought the Band-Aid would have been ripped off a lot sooner. But uh, how do you play yeah. the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen? Well, I think Ueda's first meeting is going to be at the end of the month. So he starts his job next week. He has some time to prepare. Now, I doubt very much that he will uh, come into his first meeting at the end of April and rip the Band-Aid off, as you say, and announce an end to YCC, because I think the timing of that is not ideal, given recent turbulences. Um, I think the, the timing just isn't right. Having said that, I do think that one they do abandon YCC, which I think they have to do, and they'll have to do it this year, it will be a sudden decision. There is no way to prepare the market for this, because the moment you come out and say something like, we have discussed it, it's under review, the market is going to start speculating on this change, and that's going to put massive upward pressure on yields and force the BOJ to buy these papers in big size, which they don't want to do. So the best thing to do is to keep stum about it, don't say anything, and then when the time is right, come out and change the policy. And I think the market is currently massively underpricing the risk of a substantial policy shift in Japan, and I think dollar yen has a lot of room to the downside from here onwards. Right, and of course, the uh, the dollar high versus the yen was was 150, as I know Matt would would like me to clarify. Um, Sonia, I also was lamenting to Matt about the performance of sterling. Really, since I moved mm. to the UK about five years ago, it has not been moving in my favor. But this year, 
it has. I'm surprised every time yeah. I run WCRS on the terminal and see it the best performing G10 currency, despite bets that the Bank of England mm. isn't going to be able to have an aggressive hiking cycle. What do you make of that? Well, it's a bit of a dark horse, isn't it? I mean, the news flow from the UK has been pretty disastrous for most of this year. So when you look at the newspapers and you look at what's happening in terms of government, you know, all the strikes that have happened, I mean, the news flow is terrible, as is, of course, the inflation problem. The cost of living crisis is a massive problem. And whereas inflation has come off in other parts of the world, it's very, very stubborn in the UK. So the news remained bad. But I think what's helped Sterling is the fact that fears of a very deep and long-lasting recession seem to have, well, not disappeared, but the concern is definitely lessened. So forecasts have been revised higher. And I think that sort of helped propel sterling a bit higher. Having said that, I mean, the outlook remains pretty grim. So I, I'm not optimistic here. I mean, I, I'm surprised that we're, mm. you know, 124. I, I don't see this going to 130, you know. Sonia, just, just quickly here, this Friday, it's going to be equity markets closed, a half day for the American bond market. We're going to get jobs numbers. The only thing trading is your world of FX. How do you gear up for a day like that? <laughs> with very good stop loss orders and protection in place because <laughs> it's you know it's going to all play out at the beginning of next week really so when the people come back and then we'll assess what the numbers are uh, having said that i think that it would probably have to be something below a hundred thousand to really 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 move the market you know on that side of the equation hey sonia good luck to you on that day uh i'm sorry to say i'll probably be uh, posted up at a pub somewhere all day so my thoughts will be out to you sonia martin there thanks for joining us of dz bank now coming up donald trump denounces his indictment in new york as politically motivated we're gonna have more for you on what that means for the 2024 election this is bloomberg This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You are looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with Kia Motors CEO Steve Center. That's at 12.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. And I never thought anything like this could happen in America. Never thought it could happen. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who seek to destroy it. Former President Donald Trump speaking at his estate in Florida hours after he pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Trump assailed his indictment as politically motivated, and he tried to link the case to grievances he has long deployed to hold sway over his supporters. Joining us now is Kevin Whitelaw. He's a Bloomberg editor who's covered Washington for 25 years. Kevin, great to get um, your take on this. You know, yesterday uh, seemed kind of breathless, the coverage of this. Um, it was reminiscent of the O.J. chase. We were watching Trump's private jet as it took off out of Florida and his motorcade as it traveled around Manhattan. Um, w when it comes down to it, obviously, uh, it really mattered. The only thing that really mattered was um, the indictments as after they were unsealed. What do you make of the legal case the D.A. Alvin Bragg has brought? Well, it's going to be really interesting to watch how this plays out. Um, the, the basic charges, I think, are, are laid out pretty cleanly in a set of documents that, that and checks that were written and, and other testimony that's out there about falsifying business records. And this has to do with, with payments that were made to, to, to a porn star that, that he um, uh, allegedly had an affair with. I think what's going to be what makes this complicated is that these are normally misdemeanor charges. That means a lesser kind of charge, but but they're charged as felonies because of allegations that this was connected more broadly to Trump's efforts to get himself elected. So it gets into sort of campaign finance law and, and allegations of wrongdoing on that end. That's a more complicated case to make. Um, and I think that's um, where where the where the charges from from Trump supporters that this is politically motivated might have a, uh, a chance to get some amount 
amount of credence um, from, from, from outsiders. Um, you know, having said that, Trump remains an extremely polarizing figure. So almost all the reaction out of this was entirely predictable in terms of the supporters and, of, of Trump um, decrying it um, as, as, a political, as a political use of, of the justice system and, and all of Trump's critics and opponents basically sort of applauding it and, and, and enjoying a, a, a moment of catharsis. Well, his next court date isn't until December 4th, at least when he has to appear in person, Kevin. It is such a long way away. And at the same time, December, that's when we're really going to be getting into the swing of 2024 campaigning. How does a Republican opponent of Trump deal with that? Well, I mean, it's actually a real problem for all of his opponents because, you know, the the they all have to, uh, they're all, so far at least, you know, showing some amount of, of criticism of, of the prosecutor. Almost all of them have suggested that this is politically motivated in, in some way or another. So even the ones who have been Trump skeptics or are planning to run against him are finding that they have to essentially side with Trump's arguments on this. So it does give, um, it does give the former president a bit of a leg up um, in, in, what, in, a, in a race he was already seeming to lead in when it comes to the early polling on this. So definitely puts them in a, in a tougher spot than they were and, and could at least in the short term help him. What's less clear to me is that it's going to help him much with in, in sort of a general election setup. I'm not really sure that this does all that much to, to sway sort of middle of the road voters sort of on his side. The allegations are reasonably unseemly. And I think it's really important to remember that there are several other legal investigations, both at the federal level and at the state level in other states that are ongoing into, into Donald Trump and his activities. Those could actually result in even more serious charges, depending on how those play out. Those, the timeline on those, though, is wildly unclear. And the closer it gets to an election, again, the, the, the chance of a, the risk of, of this looking political grows, too. Yeah, we're really just at the start of things here. Kevin, thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's Kevin Whitelaw. Coming up, UBS pulled off one of the biggest bank deals ever in just a matter of days. But the groundwork had been laid for years. That's the subject of today's Big Take. We'll have more on that ahead. This is Bloomberg. Credit Suisse will no longer be an independent company. We recognize and honor Credit Suisse's achievements over its 167-year history. This means a new beginning and huge opportunities ahead for the Combined Bank and for the Swiss Financial Center as a whole. That was UBS Chairman Kelleher speaking earlier at the bank's annual general meeting in Basel, Switzerland. And that takes us to today's big take. It's one in which it's described the UBS deal to pull off one of the biggest bank acquisitions ever in a matter of days. But that groundwork had been laid for years. Bloomberg Finance editor Michael Moore joins us now. This is really fascinating because it, it, it did seem like it was put together in a hurry. And at least from perhaps a regulator side, it was put together in a hurry. So what's the difference here? Why had right. UBS been spending a, a year looking at this? Well, it really dates back many years. You know, uh, UBS had done some contingency planning in the past of like, what would this look like? And then Kelleher early this year, um, you know, he saw Credit Suisse's situation and saw the likelihood was higher that something, you know, might happen. Uh, so they start, they brought in a team from Morgan Stanley, uh, where Kelleher used to work, and they started um, kind of digging into what would a deal look, look like. And, you know, that allowed them to move very quickly when, in a matter of days, Credit Suisse unraveled. How does the market judge this purchase? I mean, we uh, say, you know, forced takeover, and obviously there will be a flurry of lawsuits, and AT1s were written down to zero. But uh, in the end, for UBS, was it a gift? Is it a windfall? Is this a jackpot? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's a very cheap price, you know, by uh, compared to the book value, it's five cents on the dollar. Uh, it, it is reminiscent somewhat of J.P. Morgan's purchase of Bear Stearns, where, 
you know, you had the, a bit of a backstop from the government, you had a cheap price, J.P. Morgan ended up increasing that bid ultimately, um, but, you know, allows them to pick up a, a very attractive business, but with uh, some problems attached. So I think, you know, we'll have to see over the next couple of years how this looks in terms of the cost to unwind the pieces they don't want. That will be the big variable here. Uh, but certainly they have a lot of downside protection with the fact that the AT1s were written off and that they have this government backstop for the non-core losses. But effectively what happens is you have this Swiss behemoth, the, the kind of one bank to rule them all. It just means less right. competition in the markets. Does Reg, do regulators then turn around and say, actually, UBS, you need to start spinning off some assets. You're just too big now. Yeah, and that's something that came up at that initial press conference after the deal of would they need to spin off the Swiss unit. They, UBS would like to keep that unit. Um, they argue that the domestically, you know, they're bigger among the large corporates, but there are enough smaller banks that on a retail basis, they're not too dominant. Um, but that is going to be a political issue. There, it's already gaining attention in Switzerland. Um, so, but I think you know globally, the big uh, challenges are to merge these wealth businesses and to wind down the pieces of the investment bank that they don't want. And Kelleher has done those things before, and Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley had to merge two wealth businesses. They had to fix the investment bank. Kelleher was in charge of fixing mm. uh, the problem trading business. Uh, right. So he does, he has done this before. He knows right. the playbook here. All right, Michael, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Michael Moore. And Matt, FINMA officials were talking earlier saying, hey, look, it's smaller than uh, pre-2008, the new UBS. I'm not sure that's the corollary you want to be making these days. Yeah, no, that's the terrifying parallel. Um, and hopefully we've calmed down a little. That's it for early edition. The OG surveillance is up next with Lisa, John, and Tom. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.